I am going to hand over to Rachel, who is going to tell us all about her paper uh, with Sarah West on citizen science, pathways to impact and why participant diversity matters. And they are from the Stockholm Environmental Institute. Rachel. Thanks, Claire. <clears throat> Would you mind stop sharing? That's it. Thank you. OK, let me see if I can do this. Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks very much for inviting us here today. It's absolutely amazing to see so many of you here, which I think speaks to the importance of the topic and the interest in it. Um, as Claire said, I'm, uh, I'm a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute based at the University of York in the UK. Um, and I work in a citizen science research group, um, which has been there for the past 15, 16 years or so. Sarah, did you want to quickly introduce yourself as well? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, so I'm Sarah. I'm um, our centre director here at SEI at the University of York and um, work really closely with Rachel. We write a lot together. Um, we think about very carefully about citizen science. Um, so we do research on citizen science. Um, so who participates and who doesn't, as well as running our own um, citizen science projects and evaluating other people's citizen science projects. So really happy to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so, yeah, as Claire said, I'm going to dive into this presentation, um, which should, should take about 20 minutes or so. And then we've got lots and lots of time for discussion and um, be really fantastic to hear um, reflections and experiences from everybody here today. So, um, yeah, this will hopefully not take too long and you won't hear me too much because it would be great to hear from all of the rest of you. Um, so. As you're probably aware, given that you're all here today, um, citizen science has got a problem with engaging diverse participants. And there's a really ever-growing number of studies which show that those who are most marginalized in society, who potentially have the most to benefit from taking part in citizen science, are the li least likely to participate. So we know that participants tend to be well-educated, older, wealthier, and in the global north at least, um, white. So as Sarah said, myself and others in our, in our research group at SCI have been thinking a lot about not just those patterns of participation, but thinking about what the consequences of that lack of diversity is um, and how that can limit the impact that citizen science has the potential to achieve. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk through um, a paper we published in Citizen Science Theory and Practice last year, which was um, trying to uh, articulate the kind of cascading impacts of a lack of diversity amongst citizen science participants. So as I'm sure you'll all, all be aware, citizen science projects have really huge potential to be transformative. We'll all be aware of examples of people whose lives have taken a different course as a result of participating in projects, as well as new scientific discoveries and innovations that have arisen from citizen science, as well as its influence on policy and decision making and all sorts of other things. But a lack of diversity amongst participants really has implications for the extent to which these impacts can be achieved and who the beneficiaries of those impacts are. And while some of those consequences have begun, begun to be considered and talked about in the literature, in this paper, what we wanted to do was explore more fully the whole range of implications of a lack of diversity in citizen science and really thinking about how diversity in participants within a project has kind of cascading impacts from immediate outcomes of projects through to medium and longer out, longer term outcomes of those projects. And by doing this, what we wanted to do was really raise awareness amongst citizen science researchers, practitioners, as well as other stakeholders, such as those who might be using citizen science data about the real importance of engaging diverse participants in all types of projects. And as well to join in with others in the community who are calling for further exploration, testing and sharing of ways in which barriers to participation can be understood 
and overcome in order to open up citizen science to all so it can achieve its full potential. So for the paper, we started with a review of the literature and through doing that, what we wanted to do was gain a kind of comprehensive overview of what's been written about in terms of the outcomes that have or have the potential to arise from citizen science projects. And um, from that, we identified 70 different types of outcomes or benefits or impacts of citizen science that have been reported in the literature. And we use those to construct pathways to impact. So we know that some of the outcomes we found will arise immediately from projects, whereas others will occur in the medium or longer term. And so pathways to impact, which you can kind of see sketched out um, in this diagram, are a way of thinking about how project activities generate outputs, as well as outcomes, and then the time frame of those outcomes and how they feed into and relate to each other. So we used our list of outcomes that we derived from the literature, and with those we identified nine different pathways to impact from citizen science, and we clustered those into three groups based on the short term outcomes of projects. So one of those groups was around outcomes arising from data generated in projects. A second group was focused on outcomes for project participants and the consequences of those. And a third from um, a focused on outcomes that arise from collaborations that take place in projects. So for each of these pathways, not think, thinking really about project activities and outputs, but in terms of the short, medium and term, outcome, term outcomes, we explored how a lack of diversity in project participants could affect these outcomes of projects. And we, we kind of reflected on our own experiences of designing, running and evaluating citizen science projects, as well as our research into participant demographics to, to map out these pathways, as well as examples from the literature. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk through these pathways and reflect on how a lack of participant diversity could cascade through them. And ultimately, what we think we show in this, uh, this work is really that at best, a lack of participant diversity can reduce the likelihood of intended outcomes of projects being achieved, and at worst, can exacerbate in existing inequalities that are present in society. So this is a bit of a whistle-stop tour, and if you're interested, I'd urge you to look at the paper. I think Claire's going to post a link in the chat, if she's not done so already. Um, so there's a lot more kind of detail and nuance and examples in the paper than can be covered here. So this is what our pathways to impact look like. This is the first cluster which are centred around um, outcomes resulting from data collected within projects. And the first of these pathways relates to what's a key driver for many citizen science projects, which is to generate larger or more complete data sets than would be possible using traditional scientific methods. So this might simply be that more data are generated, saving time and money, or that projects can achieve greater spatial or temporal resolution or coverage of data, or that data comes from harder to reach places or communities. And these data are then, as we know, used for various purposes, including scientific research or monitoring, indicator tracking, impact assessment, surveillance, all sorts of things. And that in, in turn can be used to generate new scientific questions or inform policy or decision making at a variety of scales. And so for this pathway, a lack of diversity amongst participants could first of all mean just that the pool of potential participants is smaller than it could be, and that can result in less data being generated than would otherwise be possible. But a lack of diversity could also impact the representativeness of data sets. So this is an example that I saw posted on Twitter a couple of years ago, and I don't know if it's actually been published yet, it may well have been. But it looks at um, observations of squirrels recorded on the iNaturalist from um, St. Louis City in the United States. And there's a real clear overlap in where the presence of records of squirrels are, which are shown on the right, and the um, racial makeup of different areas of the city. So these observations are predominantly coming from areas where white people live, despite the fact that they're actually present throughout the whole city. 
so these biases and data sets could could then feed into decisions um, being made on these data sets, which are potentially um, unreliable. So this paper that was published by um, Charlie Blake and co-authors found that areas of high environmental um, just, environmental justice concern, for example, were underrepresented in Riverwatch surveys, again in the USA. And in this case, participants were disproportionately white, highly educated and affluent. And in this project, participants select their own sites and pay a fee for taking part. And these data are used by landowners, local and regional government, scientists, natural resource managers for research and decision making. And so the authors of this paper argue that this project could actually contribute to a feedback in which some communities continue to experience disinvestment and de degradation at the expense of areas surveyed by empowered participants. So our second pathway is thinking about the fact that citizen science can be used to generate not just more data, but also richer data. So many citizen science projects uh, have the intention of producing data sets which draw on people's experiences and perceptions and give insights into how issues affect their health and livelihoods, for example. And citizen science can also be used to include um, non-traditional forms of knowledge, local, traditional, indigenous knowledge within data sets. And again, these data sets can be used to answer scientific questions, inform monitoring, feed into policy and decision making, et cetera. And again, this raises the question as to whose experiences and perspectives are taken into account in this decision making and so who the beneficiaries are. So we found an example during research for um, this article, which we published a couple of years ago, which comes from Chennai in, in India, where a digital platform was created with the aim of crowdsourcing problems experienced by marginalised communities in order to inform urban planning. And instead, this platform was actually used by people within the middle classes and with the intention of or with the outcome of further marginalization and exclusion of the communities it was originally sought to engage. So our third pathway thinks about open science, open data, as you know, can, is that that can be accessed, used and shared by anyone and citizen science data sets are more likely to be open than other, de de other data sets generated through traditional scientific means. And making data open can facilitate its use by wider audiences for all of the purposes outlined in the first two pathways. But again, the problem here is that if open data sets have bias in them because of a lack of diversity amongst participants, then that unrepresentative data could be spread, potentially amplifying the marginalization of vulnerable communities. Another aim of open data is to increase accountability, transparency, trust in data, as well as widening participation in scientific processes beyond professional scientists. But we know that inequalities exist in digital access and competencies, and many people won't be able to use and benefit from those open data sets. There's also unfortunately the risk of open data being used unintentionally or intentionally to further marginalise vulnerable communities. And this, um, I think it's a book chapter um, that we found and have cited within the paper really nicely discusses the ethical consequences of open data, which I think are really relevant to what we're talking about here. So our next set of pathways relate to outcomes for project participants and the ongoing outcomes of those. And the first of these relates to knowledge and skills gained by, gained by participants. So we know that many projects seek to increase knowledge, awareness and understanding of issues amongst participants. And that some projects are designed in, in fact, to contribute to formal qualifications for participants. And in some cases, this can lead to participants pursuing a different career path even um, from gaining those knowledge and skills, potentially leading to upward mobility, which is, I don't know how commonly used that term is, but in the UK, we use that term to mean basically people achieving a, a higher socioeconomic status than earlier in life. 
but we know that participants actually tend to be already well ed educated and more affluent and so those potentially with the most to gain in terms of upward mobility are the least likely to be participating. Ooh. Transfer of um, knowledge and skills to participants can be done also with the intention of influencing individuals' decision making and behaviour, for example, to benefit the environment. And in some cases, to inform participants of their personal circumstances. So they can take action, for example, to protect or enhan enhance their health. And ideally, obviously, this knowledge should be open to everyone, but that's not always the case. So uh, this was an example that we found of a, a project relating to um, informing people about health risks associated with wild, wildfire air pollution so that they could then take health protective measures. But the authors found that the participants were not representative of the wider community, showed the usual demographic biases. So underrepresented groups missed out on the opportunity to learn about risks and actions that they could take to protect their health. So our next pathway relates to science capital or the kind of scientific skills, literacy, experiences, appreciation and identity people can gain from taking part in projects. That could lead to a greater understanding and trust and buy-in to science amongst participants. Obviously, the extent to which that's achieved will be limited by who and who's not able to participate. So I think this is a really nice example. So this comes from um, Richard Edwards and authors. Um, and it describes the case of a UK um, bird observation citizen science project in which they found that participants who didn't hold an educational degree reported learning outcomes that could contribute to their scientific capital, whereas those who did hold a degree didn't report those outcomes, but that those who had degrees made up two thirds of participants in the study compared to around a third of the wider population. So again, this is an, another example of where those with potentially the most to gain from participation were less likely to be participating. Another potential outcome from gaining science capital through participation is that the aim is sometimes that it will inspire people to pursue a career in science. And it's often reported that citizen science is a way, potential way of increasing the diversity of people represented in the scientific workforce. And this is uh, you know, a good thing to aim for because it can widen perspectives that are present amongst professional scientists and potentially lead to more societally relevant science taking place. But at the moment, we're seeing very similar dem demographic biases in citizen science participants as there are in the scientific workforce already. And so this potential for citizen science to increase diversity in the, in the scientific workforce is limited. So our sixth pathway is about empowering participants, which is another common goal of projects. Citizen science partic participants can become more motivated, gain self-determination through their participation, and in combination with knowledge and skills gained, this can lead, for example, to them changing their behavior, taking direct action to tackle issues, advocating for change to decision makers, and that could be related to a particular project or can even extend beyond the scope of a project. This kind of lifetime, lifelong learning that comes from citizen science participation, which can lead to more civic and political active, activeness or in general. But a failure to include marginalised groups in projects could actually therefore lead to them experiencing further disadvantage and disempowerment whilst the already more privileged in society's voices grow louder. Our seventh pathway is about meaning and connection, which I think is a really important outcome of citizen science for participants. So it's an opportunity for people to connect with nature, connect with a hobby more deeply, connect with other people, build communities, build relationships. That can result in well-being benefits for individuals. It can foster a sense of stewardship or citizenship for a place or the environment or society in general. And that increased connection between in individuals or increased social co cohesion can increase resilience to shocks and challenges that a community might experience. 
all of these aspects are really of particular importance to people from marginalized groups who often have poorer physical and mental health, live in more environmentally degraded areas and tend to be less connected with nature. So again, those with potentially the most to gain from connecting with a place and people through citizen science are the least likely to be engaged. So our final two pathways relate to the collaborations that take place within projects. Um, in pathway eight, we're thinking about science and public relations, which we've touched on already. So often citizen science projects can aim to really foster that collaboration between scientists and the public. And by bringing these groups together, different perspectives and expertise are brought together. And that can result to co-production of results not possible if either group were working alone, generating new scientific knowledge and informing policy and decision-making as we've described already. And that collaboration can build trust, understanding of different perspectives, appreciation by scientists of issues of importance to wider society. And in the long term, this could influence research agenda leading to more society, socially relevant science potentially leading to decision-making that benefits wider society more generally. But where participants aren't, aren't diverse, this decision-making could instead reflect existing power structures in society and generate collaborations, which actually reinforce those experiences, experiences and perspectives that are heard and those existing decision-making structures, the groups, to which resources, including finance, are distribu distributed. The lack of diversity in this case really severely limits citizen science's potential to democratize science. And our final pathway relates to wider partnership building. So as you'll know, often projects include parties beyond scientists and the public, including policymakers, decision makers, service providers, NGOs, businesses, all sorts of organizations. And citizen science can really provide that space for these groups to interact, leading to knowledge transfer, improved understanding, increased trust between these groups, creative solutions to issues. And this engagement could increase the likelihood that results are used to inform decision making or action and at a faster rate that might, that might otherwise occur. But if marginalized groups aren't involved in projects, then decision makers won't gain an understanding of their perspectives and decisions won't be ma made which improve their situation. And whilst citizen science can provide an opportunity to foster creativity, the extent to which this is achieved will be limited by the diversity of experiences and perspectives present. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this paper, which highlights this and really says that a diversity of knowledge inputs tends to increase the quality of solutions. So we know that if we have limited diversity, maybe our solutions won't, to those problems won't be as good. So to conclude, increasing access to citizen science projects is something we're really passionate about, as I'm sure you all are too. There are myriad benefits of that for research, for our participants and for wider society. That can be achieved if we're inclusive. So we're really happy to be invited to talk to you today and to now hear from all of you about your perspectives and because I said to Claire at the beginning I feel like we're presenting the problem with this paper and it would be really nice to move on and um, hear from you about potential solutions. Thank you.